In lecture five, I want to start pulling a lot of the pieces together. The last few lectures, what we've looked at is the idea of um, vectors representing the state of quantum mechanical systems, how to calculate the probabilities of various measurement outcomes for a system, and the idea of operators um, in quantum mechanics. And today's lecture, what I want to do is break it into two parts. In the first part, what I want to do is look at something that Susskind calls the fundamental theorem of quantum mechanics. And I like this because it, it really nicely gives meaning to the idea of eigenvalues and eigenvectors for an operator and why we care so much about those things. I'm then going to deal with completeness, which is um, something that's often overlooked in quantum mechanics courses, but ends up being rather important if you go on doing quantum mechanics for a long period of time. And then in the second half, what I want to do is come back to our quantum spin system and start to look very specifically at what operators look like for quantum spin systems. So we'll get out um, all the matrix operators that we would normally get for a spin system. And those will set us up for lecture six, where we basically start to look at how to calculate probabilities of spin, not just along X and what, uh, not just along Z or X, but in any arbitrary direction we like. OK, so I'm going to need some slides. Where we're going to start is with this fundamental theorem of quantum mechanics. And the crucial idea behind it is that all observable quantities in quantum mechanics are represented by Hermitian matrices. Okay, And an extension of, of, of this idea or something that we need for it to work is that our eigenvalues and eigenvectors need to have certain properties. Okay, So you'll remember back to the last lecture, what we showed was that we can take a given operator um, as a matrix and we can calculate the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. Okay, And for an n by n matrix, we'll get n eigenvalues. Those eigenvalues are not necessarily equal to each other, but sometimes can be. Okay. And so there's basically three points to this fundamental theorem of quantum mechanics. What we're going to do is go through, prove the first one, because it's a really nice example of how to do algebra in bracket notation. The second one we'll dig into a little bit. Um, and then the third one is really just an axiom. So we'll go through that fairly quickly. So let's look at the first one. Basically, the first one says that if lambda 1 and lambda 2 are two unequal eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator, then the corresponding eigenvectors are orthogonal. Okay, so um, I'll need some writing paper. Let's just go through and work this up. So where we're going to start is with eigenvalue equations. We saw these in the last lecture, but um, we'll, we'll put them down now for the two um, unequal eigenvalues that we have in this particular case. Okay. So um, what we'll be writing here is L lambda 1 is equal to lambda 1 lambda 1, right? And let's call this equation 1. What that equation basically says is that if lambda 1 is an eigenvector of the matrix operator L, um, what we will get is that eigenvector back multiplied by a number and it'll be a complex number, and that complex number is what we call the corresponding eigenvalue. Okay, Now, we can do that for eigenvalue 1. We can do the same thing for eigenvalue 2. Both of these equations will hold simultaneously. So what we can do here is write something that looks like this. As so, okay? So as I've mentioned in the last lectures, um, a lot of developing mathematical frameworks sometimes is just playing around and finding out what the rules of the system are. And so what I'm going to do here is going to look like a really obvious derivation, but at the end it's really arrived at from either trying to prove a relation or playing around and finding out that it has significant meaning, right? And in this particular case, what we're going to show is that if the two eigenvalues are not equal, the corresponding eigenvectors have to be orthogonal, okay? So the way we can do this is First, we're going to take the first equation and we're going to take the conjugate of it, okay? So um, conjugate of equation 1 will give us something that looks like this. Uh, lambda 1 L dagger is equal to lambda 1 star lambda 1, okay? And you'll notice here I'm obeying the same conventions I was talking about in the last lecture with um, bras being over on the left, kets being over on the right, um, 
matrices always end up up against the the long line for the bracket and numbers I can put pretty much anywhere I like okay all right we know that our operator here is Hermitian they always are in quantum mechanics so we know that L dagger is equal to L and so we could basically rewrite this thing as lambda 1 L is equal to lambda 1 star lambda 1 okay like so. And so let's call this equation three, just to keep a track of what's going on in here. Um, okay, we know one other thing in here, um, right at this point, which is that um, the eigenvalues for a Hermitian operator are real, okay? And so that means that lambda one conjugate is equal to lambda one. And so an additional step I can take right in here is basically just to get rid of that conjugate sign, okay? Any, any element that's on the diagonal for a Her Hermitian matrix is for her mission matrices needs to be um, reals, otherwise it's not equal to its own conjugate. Okay, so what we can do is take equation three now and multiply it by lambda two, okay? And we're really just doing things because we can here mathematically at the moment. Later on, we'll see that there's a, there's a method behind what's going on here. Um, so what we would do here now is put the kets over on the right. And so what this would look like is lambda 1 L lambda 2 is equal to lambda 1 lambda 1 lambda 2. Okay. And so you'll notice the thing on the left is basically an expectation or something that looks like an expectation value. It's not an expectation value because lambda 1 is not equal to lambda 2 in this particular case, but it looks like one. And then the thing on the right is, is essentially an inner product. Okay. So let's call this 4 because we're going to use this in a moment. And then what we're going to do, and this is a really common approach in physics, you try to come to something that's the same via two different pathways and then you show that those two things that should be the same must be equal and use that to get something out, okay? And so you'll notice that we've got this, this thing here, uh, lambda one, L lambda two. We can make that in another way. And the way that we can make something that looks like that is we can take equation two and multiply it by the bra lambda one, right? So let's do that. What we would get is lambda one, the uh, bra goes to the left-hand side, L lambda two, is equal to, um, you'll notice, you, you'll know that the number can come out the front. So this will give me my lambda two here. And then I would have lambda one, lambda two, like so. Okay. And so this we can call equation number five, right? So you'll notice that this term at the front for both of those two equations arrived at by different ways is now the same, right? And if we take the same number and subtract it from itself, we should get zero, okay? So let's do this. Let's take equation four and subtract equation five from it. So what we would get here is basically lambda one L lambda two minus lambda one L lambda two, which would be equal to zero, but it's also equal to term right hand side term of four minus right hand side term of five okay so this would be lambda one lambda one lambda two minus lambda two lambda one lambda two like so okay and of course the term on the right hand side is the same so the way we could write this instead is as lambda one minus lambda two lambda one lambda two okay and of course, this thing's equal to zero, right? We showed that just up above. There's only two ways that that equation can hold here, right? The first one is that this is equal to zero. And for that to be equal to zero, we would need lambda one to equal lambda two, right? But we know from where we started this problem um, up here that lambda one is not equal to lambda two, okay? So this one, is never going to hold. The only way that this can happen is that this thing here is equal to zero, right? Um, and we know that if lambda one, lambda two is equal to zero, then uh, lambda one is orthogonal to lambda two. Okay, so we've basically just proved the um, exact point that we wanted to point prove up here, which is that if lambda one and lambda two are two unequal eigenvalues of a Hermitian operator, then the corresponding eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other. Okay. 
Um, this kind of makes sense, right? You can imagine lambda 1 and lambda 2 being two measurables. It might be um, plus 1 and minus 1 for sigma z. And then the corresponding eigenvectors, which would be up and down, end up being orthogonal, right? And the fact that lambda 1 is not equal to lambda 2 makes up not um, makes up orthogonal to down. Okay, fairly simple idea here. The one place where this kind of comes a little bit unstuck, and it's 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 sort of an exception point, is if lambda one is equal to lambda two. Okay, if lambda one is equal to lambda two, then lambda one minus lambda two can be equal to zero, which then means that the um, inner product we have on the right, lambda 1, lambda 2, could in principle be anything we like, right? So that brings me to the second point here, which is that we need to deal with the special case, and it's it's not the norm, but it does happen in operators, where there are two eigenvalues that are equal to each other. And that case we have to deal with as a separate line of logic, because the, the maths we just did is, is not going to give us a relation that works there, okay? So before I go on to talk about um, what degeneracy means, let me just stay down this line of logic and show that um, the corresponding eigenvalues are orthogonal even if lambda 1 equals lambda 2, okay? So there's a, a line of logic in here which goes that lambda 1 and lambda 2 are basis vectors, right? So we have this idea that they correspond to something that's measurable. And we may not yet be able to say that they're orthogonal because, you know, the, the previous line of argument that we did doesn't work very well if lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2. But we know they're linearly independent, right? If you think back to lecture 2, what we showed was that for any two linearly independent vectors, we can use the Gram-Schmidt procedure to turn them into an orthonormal basis, all right? So what we know here is that in the case where lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2, we, we know that those two vectors um, have to be um, linearly independent, or the corresponding eigenvectors have to be linearly independent. And if they're linearly independent, then we can basically just use the Gram-Schmidt procedure to say that they're orthogonal, right? This comes back to the main reason why I put um, the Gram-Schmidt procedure back in lecture two, and I didn't want you to know how to use it. I just want you to know how it works so that you know two important things in there, which is in order for this to work, we need to know two things. The first is that we need to know that um, a linear combination Of, of two eigenvectors is an eigenvector. And the other one we need to know is that um, is the unit vector of an eigenvector also an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue. And so the idea we're taking here is that what we need to do if we're going to invoke the Gram-Schmidt procedure to get us out of trouble in this second point where the eigen corresponding eigenvalues are equal, um, what we need to do is basically know that that procedure when we implement it is not going to mess up um, our eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And what I mean by not mess it up is we need to know that the steps that happen in the Gram-Schmidt procedure conserve the eigenvalue for a given eigenvector. 
Okay, and you'll remember there's two things that we do when you go back to the Graham Schmidt procedure. One is that you basically take a vector and you make it the unit length, you divide it by its own length. And the other one was that you did um, a, a subtraction, right? A subtraction is really just a linear combination. You're adding something to a minus to a negative number. And so what we want to check there is that those conserve the eigenvalues, because if they do, then the way to handle this second point here um, is just to invoke the Graham Schmidt procedure to cover off um, eigenvector lambda one and eigenvector lambda two being orthogonal, okay? So um, these are pretty quickly proven and I'll just go through them because they're actually kind of um, nice to do in here. So what we're gonna do here is um, start with our two eigenvalue equations again. So lambda lambda one um, is lambda one lambda one and L on lambda two is equal to lambda 2, lambda 2. And what I'm going to do here is go that lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2. And just to avoid having to write 1s and 2s all the time, what I'm going to do is basically just call this lambda. Okay, really common thing to do when two things are equal. So the way we could write this here is basically we can get rid of this subscript here and get rid of this subscript here. And basically just say that um, if I operate the operator L on lambda one, I will get lambda times lambda one. I, I have an eigenvector um, go through, but there's a common eigenvalue. And then um, if L operates on lambda two, I get lambda times lambda two, and that lambda is the same whether I do it on lambda one or lambda two, right? So this is really just the coincidental case where lambda one is equal to lambda two in terms of the eigenvalues. Okay, so let's deal with the linear combination first. Um, what we can do here is just come up with some arbitrary linear combination. Let's call this A. So A will just be alpha times lambda 1 plus beta times lambda 2. And the whole point here is just to show that we conserve eigenvalues on the way through when we do this. Okay. So let's say we've got operator L acting on our um, state A. This will be... Um, you know that we can pull the numbers out the front. So this will be alpha L lambda one plus beta L lambda two, okay? And of course, now we can operate the operator on the, um, on the states here to get the eigenvalues. So this will be alpha lambda lambda one plus beta lambda lambda two, just here, okay? Of course, we can common factor this out. So the lambda will come out the front, lambda alpha lambda one plus beta lambda two. And so this thing is just lambda A. Okay, so what we've basically shown is that we can take the linear combination of two vectors um, with a common eigenvalue and the that linear combination will also have the same eigenvalue which is just lambda down here okay so that's the first part of this done the second part of this is just to show what happens for um, our unit vector case and so for our unit vector case what we're going to do is just define a as um, lambda one on um, lambda one on the length of lambda one so we're basically just dividing a vector by its unit vector and so really what we're saying here is just that a is equal to the unit vector um oops let's write properly uh lambda one hat okay so we're just turning it into a unit vector essentially and so what we're going to do is go through the same line of logic so now we're going to act l on our state a here and so this would be L lambda one on lambda one, like so, okay? And of course we know that the length is just a number, right? So the way we can write this is as one on lambda one uh, L lambda one. And then of course we, act that operator. So now we've got one on lambda one, uh, lambda, lambda one just here. Okay. And then um, we can rewrite this to look a little bit like this. This is probably a pedantic step, but let me just do it just so it's really clear. 
like so. And this is really just lambda times our original state A, okay? So what we've just shown is that if we take the linear combination of two eigenvectors, um, the eigenvalue is conserved. Um, and if we take the um, unit vector of an eigenvector, the um, eigenvalue is conserved as well. Those two things are steps in the Gram-Schmidt procedure. The Gram-Schmidt procedure basically says we can take any line linearly independent vectors and turn them back into um, an orthonormal basis. And so the net result of this is that whether two eigenvalues are unequal or equal, the corresponding eigenvectors can be shown to be orthogonal, okay? Now, what we tend to do here is use a term that we call degeneracy to describe the case where two different eigenvectors have the same value. And what this basically means is if, if what we did was say, look, lambda one is equal to lambda two, and so we'll consider them the same and we'll only have one um, eigenvector for them, because um, they must be the same eigenvector, right? That's a wrong statement. And that's a wrong statement because what we're really saying here is that we've got two separate states and all, it's, all that happens when the eigenvalues are equal is that they happen to have the same measurement outcome, but they're not necessarily the same state, okay? Um, and if what we do is basically just say, oh, you know, we'll collapse those two vectors into one, what we're actually doing is building a mathematical framework where we're missing a piece, right? We're missing the possibility of two particular states having the same or having the same measurable outcome at some particular point, okay? To give you an example of this, if you think back to sort of your atomic theory from your first year lectures, what you probably know is that you've got a, a nucleus and you have a whole pile of um, energy levels and it's possible to be in different states but have the same energy level, right? So your first level has one state, your second, your second level has four states, your third level has nine states and so forth. And those are distinct separate states. They just happen to have the same energy, right? It's the same idea that you're getting here. The eigenvalue is the observable outcome, so the measurement of the energy. The eigenvector corresponds to the state of the system. If we took those you know, multiple possibilities that happen to have the same energy and just merge them into one, when you do things with atomic spectra, for example, as you'll see in um, your high year lab courses, um, you'll learn about it in chemistry as well. You can often break the degeneracy that you have in atomic systems and basically take those different states and move them apart in energy, right? And then what you've got is a case where you've got two orthogonal um, states that at, at an initial position have lambda one equal to lambda two. And then what you do is you do something to the system and you basically make lambda one slightly not equal to lambda two. If what you've done is basically said, well, those things are the same state because they have the same eigenvalue, then you can't, your mathematical framework can't deal with the fact that you can separate those things. Okay, and so this is why um, we have this idea in quantum mechanics that every single eigenvalue for a um, operator corresponds to its own eigenvector and we have a full set that spans the set for the matrix. Okay, so if you have an n by n operator, you'll have n eigenvalues all the ones that are different or orthogonal, all the ones that are the same correspond to orthogonal vectors as well. And in a sense, you can see this is just sort of being circularly consistent. We started out in quantum mechanics by saying, what we're gonna do is make a vector space where every possible measurable outcome has a dimension in the space, right? So our quantum spin system had a possible up and down. And so there's two dimensions um, in that space which end up being up and down. If what we were to do then is to say, well, actually now um, the two measurable outcomes are the same, we're gonna collapse this down now to a one dimensional space, we would lose that ability to have those separate measurements just because two numbers happen to be the same. Okay, so really we're just being internally consistent with this idea that when we started, what we did was um, have a number of dimensions that is equal to the number of possible measurable outcomes. It's just that if two measurable outcomes happen to be equal, they correspond to separate states. They just happen to have a, a, an equal outcome. And the one place where you see this best is, is sort of atomic theory, okay? 
So the third point here, and this is something of a mathematical axiom, um, I'd have to go off into long tracts of um, some of your maths courses to prove this one. So we're just going to take this as given. And it's that the eigenvectors of a Hamilton of a Hermitian operator are a complete set. And what that means is that any vector the operator can generate can be expanded as a sum of its eigenvectors. The easiest way I can think about this is to think about the nature of vector spaces. Any vector that's in the space, and you'll remember this from lecture two when we defined a basis, you have the idea that we can take the basis vectors and some linear combination of all the basis vectors will give us um, every possible vector in the state. Okay, And you know the components of some of these might be zero, but we still have that linear combination. And so what we really have is this idea that um, the basis forms a complete set for the space, which basically means that we every vector we have, the complete set of vectors can be described by that basis, right? That's this idea of completeness that I'll come back to in a second. What we're doing here with this fundamental theorem of quantum mechanics, and I think this is the probably the distillation of the most important point here, what we're doing is basically saying that for any observable, we have an operator. The eigenvectors of that operator will be the basis for the vector space that we operate in. Okay, And so this is sort of this um, summary point that we get at the end here. Um, the eigenvectors of a Hermitian operator form an orthonormal basis. What we're basically saying is the way we set up quantum mechanics is we have vectors, which are the states of systems. Um, we have operators, which represent our observables. The eigenvectors of those operators are what makes up the basis. And then we basically project our state vector onto that basis to get the probabilities and measurement outcomes. And for the eigenvectors, which set up the basis for the state, the corresponding eigenvalues are just what the measurable outcome will be when you um, do a measurement and find that particular state, right? So if we take a state vector and we um, do a measurement and we get it pointing up, the outcome will be plus one because that's the eigen corresponding eigenvalue. And if we get it down, the corresponding eigenvalue is minus one and we'll get that, okay? So really what we're doing here is just coming around the loop and making something that's a mathematically consistent package by properly defining what eigenvalues and eigenvectors mean in the context of, 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 of our Hilbert space. Okay, so this brings me to the last point I want to cover just for this first half of the lecture, which is an idea called completeness. Um, if you, for example, have a look in Griffiths, go to the index at the back and look up completeness, it will point you to a page, you'll have a look in there, and it will basically just say completeness, blah, blah, blah. Um, very, very short description, not really sold as a very big, important concept um, in, in quantum mechanics. And you'll find the same thing when you look in other textbooks. One thing you realize if, you, if you're a student all the way, you know, doing a physics major and going all the way through, through quantum mechanics is this thing called completeness shows up again and again and again, but you never really get taught it properly. It just sort of pops up as an observation somewhere in a textbook. And I actually like to point it out because once you realize that it exists, whole piles of things that you'll see later on in quantum mechanics will make sense, right? So to give you sort of a, an example from my experience as an undergraduate, I would see this thing over here on the right all the time, this what we call a completeness relation. And since I never got formally shown what this thing is, it was just kind of expected, hey, you'll know what this thing is. Um, I saw it and I never really realized the significance of it, okay? Um, and, and same with this idea of completeness on the left. Okay, if we step back a second, it kind of connects to this idea um, in the third point. Um, what we're really doing here with this idea of, of completeness is, is, is writing mathematically what we mean by the, any vector in the state being able to be written as a linear combination of all of the basis vectors. Okay, and so what we're doing here is saying our space will have a whole pile of basis vectors those basis vectors will be the eigenvectors for whatever operator we're dealing with in that space, okay? If it's a quantum spin system, um, we will deal with, you know, like a sigma Z or a sigma X or something like that, whichever direction we're looking at, we're looking in Z, we'll have like a um, sigma Z. It will have, it's a two by two matrix, it will have two eigenvalues 
and uh, sorry, two eigenvectors, and those two eigenvectors will be the basis states up and down, right? Um, so what we're really saying here is just these are the eigenve eigenvectors, and then any particular vector we like can be written as a sum of those or a linear combination of those particular eigenvectors, okay? And they will have prefactors, um, uh, lambda i here, which will not necessarily be the um, eigenvalues because you'll only get the eigenvalues out if your state vector is along one of the basis vectors, right? Um, it will have something else. And then the sum of those prefactors, as we saw in earlier lectures, will add up to one so that you've got a properly normalized vector in, in this space, okay? And so this is really just what we call a completeness relation. It's a general way of writing for every particular case, how do I write a state vector in quantum mechanics? Basically, it will be um, the sum of all the basis vectors, which are just the eigenvectors for um, whatever system you're looking at, um, multiplied by prefactors that are normalized. And then the last thing in here is this thing called a completeness relation, okay? Um, and if you go on to sort of, you know, honors quantum mechanics, third year quantum mechanics, you'll see this thing invoked quite a lot. Um, often what you will do is you'll have something and what you'll do is, is use this backwards. You'll say that one is equal to this thing. And so what I can do is take anything, multiply it by one, pop this thing in, um, build it into the sum, use um, sort of either orthogonality relations or normality relations to cancel out a whole pile of terms and get you to a final result, okay? This thing in here is just a projection operator, right? Um, you can imagine that we can take any of our particular eigenvectors and sub slot them in there. So what this is really saying, you could imagine for our um, spin system, we've got two possible eigenvectors up and down. So what this is, is the sum of up, up, plus the sum of down, down. If you imagine up, up in here, this is really just the projection operator for measuring a spin up. And then if you put down in here, that's a projection operator for measuring spin down. And of course, you know the probability of getting down at, and the probability of getting up must add to one. So all this relation here really says is that the probability of all the measurable outcomes has to be equal to one, right? Really, this is just saying that the entire probability space for the system will be covered by all of the possible measurable outcomes. That's all it is, okay? Um, anyway, I just wanted to highlight these because um, when I was an undergraduate, this is probably one of the biggest sticking points I had was that people started using completeness relations and completeness without actually ever telling me what they were. And I wanna try and correct that error by making sure right here in this second course, uh, second year course, you see what these are so that later on when they pop up, they make complete sense, okay? So I think we'll finish here for the first half, take a little bit of a break, and we'll come back and look in detail at spin matrices for our quantum spin system so that some of the more abstract ideas we've been playing with this first half of this lecture and the last lecture start to make a little bit more sense.